If I remember correctly, which I most definitely probably don't, it's morning and I'm 10 or 11 years old, maybe nine. It's the middle of that week that bridges Christmas and New Year. That hot, slow, quiet week. That week of darkened rooms with blinds and curtains shut all day. That week of cups of ice in lieu of water and cheap frozen tubes of cordial. That week of sprinkler jumping in the front garden and a plastic clamshell swimming pool out back. Lying still in my bottom bunk, I've been awake for a while. Our bedroom is hushed, muted. My brothers are asleep, all with mouths agape. Their sighs don't travel far. Two bunk beds, two cupboards, a wooden toy chest, scrunched clothes, hung up towels, plastic action figures and sporting gear all leave little room for sound. I wake earlier than my brothers most mornings. I like to blame the vertical crack of sunlight that screams through the gap between the blind and the window. But I know inwardly that I savour being awake first. There's something seductive in the feeling of power, something in that secret knowing that exists in our bedroom in that earliest yawn of day. I eavesdrop on my brother's dreams, a half moan here, a whispered sentence there. I'm not a very good older brother, and I'm aware of this all the time. I hope that if it comes down to it, I'd put myself in the way of anything that threatened them. But a part of me despairs, sometimes and quietly, that maybe I wouldn't. I can hear Mum moving around the other end of the house. She's always up for us. I like to track her movements as she moves from room to room. The running water from her shower. The gentle morning clatter of clean dishes. The crunch of wicker washing basket. If I stay utterly still and hold my breath and close my eyes and wait, and there are no cars passing and the wind is calm and my brothers are quiet, I can hear her bare feet on every scratched and faded floorboard. Even today, I'd recognize that trudging rhythm anywhere. It's the footsteps of home. There's crying, and like a water bomb dropped from a roof, the familiar tempo of the morning splits and bursts. A squeal, and then a squeak. Sounds new and different. A hurried, irregular shuffling and muffled sobbing, and I'm up, heading for the noises, stepping on the bottoms of my green and white striped pyjamas. They cause me to slide on the hallway floor and even in my rush, I notice that it kind of feels like I'm rollerblading. The sobbing blubs out again and now I, know, now I know it's coming from the laundry. I edge in silence towards the not quite closed door. Mum is standing over the sink. Her shoulders are shaking with the effort of trying to cry noiselessly. She doesn't notice me, but I can see her face. I've seen mum cry lots of times. She's the mother of five boisterous pests after all. But this is different. The parts are all familiar. Running nose, flushed cheeks, tiny rolling pins of flesh on her forehead squeezed white. And yet the overall impression frightens me more than anything before. And I don't know why. Mum's arms are thrust in the low slung laundry sink yellow and green washing gloves on her hands. In the rubber straight jacket of her grip, under a foot of water, is a guinea pig. It's thrashing, kicking out with all four legs in holy panic. The water bubbles like a pot of spaghetti, and there are fine brown and white hairs all over the surface, some of them sticking to the metal sides of the sink. Mum's tears spilled down her face into the pitching water, each drop trapping the early morning light that's roaring through the window. And yes, sure, later in the day, everything's explained and re-explained. 
the guinea pigs had to die. After feeding the rest of our animals, the dog, rabbits, birds, mice and sea monkeys, mum had gone to feed the guinea pigs, who'd been banished to the back fence next to the compost bin because of their smell and incessant squeaking. Our oldest guinea pig of them all, Martha, had given birth a few weeks earlier to a handful of sopping, slimy, squirmy nuggets. None of us had known she was pregnant, but the arrival of a pile of babies was just another unsurprising surprise in our small animal kingdom. So Martha had plopped out half a dozen miniature versions of herself, and yet something was wrong from the start. That awful morning, Mum had realised had figured it out. The father of Martha's babies must have been kin, a brother, or cousin, or son. Like royalty of old, the guinea pigs in breeding had fucked everything up. <laughs> so that all the babies were in some way physically or mentally disabled. Gammy legs, misshapen skulls, bung eyes, lacking the capacity to even eat, the poor mangled creatures had to be put down. And still, with an explanation as pragmatic and kind-hearted as this, for the longest time afterwards, I can't shake the feeling from that morning of pure awfulness. It lives just under my skin for years, and then for more years after that. Like a hillside altered, by the felling of a tree, I'm slightly different. That morning, when I'd run down the hallway, I'd done it with the leaden anticipation of a world gone wrong. I'd expected to come upon something dreadful, had actually looked forward to it. Much, much later, maybe even today, maybe even not yet, but sometime in the future, I'd realised that this is what being an adult always feels like driving a car, willing for an accident, travelling overseas in the hope of danger, reading books and watching films, and starting a family in the hope of fighting and mayhem and hate. I'd learned something that morning, or maybe unlearned it. Whichever the case, that knowledge took me even further away from my brothers and family. That kicking, squealing, Drowning guinea pig had signposted a juncture in my life that I still believe I'll eventually look back to and think, was that it? And it wasn't even remarkable that day, that morning. That was the thing. The whole incident reeked of ordinary, everyday, commonplace horror. That was the thing, and it still is. <laughs>